I'd like to introduce our second assignment, which will be uh, a painting from observation. In other words, we're actually doing something realistic this time. But before we get into that, I'd like to uh, go over some of the materials, just review some of the materials that you'll be using. Obviously, you've got your paintbrushes, that kit of that, that little pack of paintbrushes in various sizes and, um, and lengths, uh, from very tiny number ones to, uh, to a number 10 large. Um, for the most part, you will be using, in this particular painting, the number four, flat. And you'll notice that some of them are flat and some of them are round at the end. This is a number four as well, but it's got a roundish edge and this one here that's not used. And this one here has a more cut off horizontal edge. This will be the brush that you'll use primarily for this assignment, although you're welcome to use any of them in terms of larger spaces to be filled in. And even if you're trying to pick away at some details, this number one brush right here. Uh, the other obvious thing that we'll be using is a canvas board. We've got these canvas boards for the most part. You have, a, you have smaller ones that are 11 by 14, two of them, but these five that you have in your kit are 16 inches by 20 inches. And um, they are great because they are rigid. They can be moved around, they're, they're durable. And the one thing about the observation painting that you need to keep in mind is that uh, if you have your canvas at an angle, at a near vertical or a high angle that is close to the to the plane that you're staring at. In other words, if it if you see the canvas upright somewhat and the still life that you are working on, you have a more accurate vision, a more accurate comparison, a more accurate judgment about where where things are, how to draw them, how to paint them, and how to place them in in the uh, the canvas. The other so t so the <laughs> the challenge becomes how you take this canvas board and make it uh, into that somewhat of an angle in relation to the, to the still life. And uh, although you could, you know, very awkwardly hold it, uh, uh, you, you need to prop it against something, it needs to be stable. And what I found, if you're not uh, well, uh, able to invest or uh, interested in investing in a table easel, uh, you can uh, use two, uh, two chairs, one to sit in and one to, uh, with plastic covering, hold this canvas in a kind of near upright plane uh, in relation to, your, to the object that you're painting. You also can, uh, um, with a, either a hardboard, like a masonite hardboard, or if you're, in these days, uh, you know, we've got lots of things coming from Amazon. If you took uh, a large sheet of cardboard, slightly larger than this, and uh, secured the canvas board on the cardboard, you've got uh, a kind of margin uh, of, uh, of um, planar material, which you can slop and, 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 uh, and paint over and becomes a kind of more rigid uh, thing to, to angle against the chair or the table easel that you're, that you're dealing with. Uh, there are some links in the, in the text that will give you um, uh, examples of table easels, uh, but they run from about uh, oh, $10 to $25. I'm not requiring it all. You can do probably very well uh, with some improvised uh, um, angles to the canvas. Um, you uh, will also, as we've so said before, have a, a plastic uh, tub with water, uh, the spray bottle, the Payne's Gray, and the Titanium White, which you have in your kit. You will also um, have your palette, your palette knife, uh, and uh, an, ar an arrangement of paper towels off to the side that you'll need to wipe brushes, etc., etc. Now, I uh, have set up a still life here. The point of this is, is uh, that we're doing something from real life in very limited color. The situation that you want to give yourself is one, uh, the use of white objects. I want to limit the complexity of color to the nth degree in this particular uh, assignment. Uh, we'll get into color very shortly, but uh, just to get a sense of, of lights and darks, of the solidity and volumetric sculptural feel of things through lights and darks, uh, I want you to set up something that's starkly white. Okay, a coffee mug, um, uh, whatever white hat, shoes, uh, 
uh, one to three objects, one to three objects, depending on how ambition and what kind ambitious and what kind of um, what kind of experience you've had, would be a good place to start with this uh, this assignment. And if you can, I would really encourage it. If it were on a table whereby there were space uh, behind it, I've set up this false theater here of a black board in back and a white uh, board on the surface. But if you can, in your uh, environment, if you can set up an object on perhaps a surface with a white piece of paper underneath it or some light value underneath it, white color under, light color underneath it, and have just an anonymous vacant space behind, which you will not paint, okay, you will not paint in detail, you're not, you're not going to be doing a whole environmental interior architectural painting, but you're going to be doing a kind of modest tabletop still life whereby you've got some anonymous space in back, some, some ill-defined space in back, which you can paint in a variety of values to, to contrast with the objects. Now in uh, preparing for this, you become the theater director. You become uh, the person who is setting up the lighting, the objects, and uh, there are some simple things to keep in mind for this to be successful, and that would be uh, control the lighting. Uh, get a lamp, a clamp lamp, uh, or, or any kind of portable light source that could be moved relatively close and be placed relatively low in relation to the object itself. If you have a thousand light sources, if you have uh, you know an even light all around the environment, you're not going to get the kind of sculptural definition, the kind of highlight and shadow definition that you would obviously when you have a kind of single direct uh, light source. The, uh, the other thing I've talked about is that you have some sort of space beyond, and that's going to be a dark, anonymous space. You also, because of the light source, because of the, um, the closeness of the light source and its strength, uh, I want you to consider the importance of a cast shadow uh, in your setup. It's not just the nothingness that's... that's, uh, that's uh, to be ignored, but it is part of a strong set of shapes that will become part of the composition, the composition, the setup, the design uh, of your still life. Because your board is relatively large and because um, if you give it yourself a little margin around the, the canvas panels, the canvas boards, it sets off the, the work uh, you know, without a frame. It sets off the work quite nicely formally. Um, get yourself some masking tape. It doesn't have to be terribly expensive or high quality. There is this artist masking tape which can be relatively expensive in art supply stores. I found that, uh, that the hardware store, paint store, um, interior painting tape works well, although I wouldn't advise using the blue or the, dark, or the uh, bright green because it, it destroys the, your, your um, perception of color. But I've taken this, I've measured it with a ruler, and I've taken this, uh, this tape and simply come in, I think, about an inch and a half. It's up to you. You can, you go, you can go in a little bit farther if you want. You've got a big canvas. Uh, I've gone in an inch and a half and put the tape around the outside at that, uh, at that depth. And then, strangely enough, if you want it really to be um, a crisp edge, you have in your kit something that looks like this. It's not necessarily the same um, brand, but this is called gel medium. You have a, a jar. I think this time it's going to be a jar. Sometimes it's a big tube, but a jar or tube of, of um, gel medium. It really is for uh, addition to the uh, abstract expressionist and, and textual kinds of uh, paint strokes that we'll be doing through the semester later on. But here it becomes a kind of unofficial, uh, semi-lawful use of the, of the gel medium. If you take some on your finger, and if your, your tape is fairly secure down to the canvas board, if you simply smear very lightly and without too much texture or, or uh, agitation, you get a smooth, um, seal, a kind of plastic seal that is covering both the tape and the canvas board itself. If that is allowed to dry, it forms that kind of seal and allows you to pull off the tape at the very, very end, at the, the final completion of the, of the painting itself so that you have that, that crisp um, border for your painting.
So although you're, you're welcome to, to erase and to move and to recombine things and, and redo things on this, on this canvas board, uh, you know, it, it's a process of placing these things where in the end you want them to be. In other words, just like, just like you're taking a digital camera uh, photo at Thanksgiving with the family, you know, who you put in, you know, the angle you take, uh, the particular composition you do, that, those kinds of things are just as important in a, in a still life. So my particular contour drawing, just a, mostly a line drawing, uh, I've over killed it with the, the uh, darkness of the outline so you can see it more clearly in the video. You don't necessarily have to do this kind of uh, dark drawing, but you do need to put in the contours as you see them. Do your best. It's not um, it's not a drawing course, so you don't necessarily have to get photographic uh, uh, perfection with your shapes, but do your best to get the shapes where you want them in the composition. And just to give you a shorthand, just to give you a, uh, uh, a clue as to where to put the shadows, maybe a rough, rough, rough uh, putting in of, uh, of where the big basic shadows would be in the object. And that includes also the big basic shadows that are the the cast shadows as well. So in, in still life painting, the traditional way is to start with a kind of um, structure of darker values. So I'm gonna mix some grays here, which I, uh, I'm assuming to be the, the darker values on the bottle itself. And as in our first painting, you, you realized how quickly uh, the gray becomes dark, 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 depending on uh, even the smallest amount of of Payne's gray that you put in there. Um, I might hold it up to the actual object that I'm doing. And with acrylics, most some of you who've used acrylics before will know this, but with acrylics, they tend to dry a little bit darker than, um, than you mix them. Not too much, but they tend to dry a little bit darker, so keep that in mind. I mean, you'll, you'll just sense this without being too self-conscious about it uh, as we go on. And the other sort of basic rule made to be broken, but nonetheless good to start out with, would be to keep the initial paint on the object on the still life relatively thin and washy. It's not quite a watercolor, but you want to... Um, you want to, to put on paint that is fairly brushy and loose and easily um, applied. So I'm gonna move out here and taking a look at this, I'm gonna to begin to put on, that's a pretty good value. And you're welcome to use any of your smaller brushes too, but in a kind of washy, it's even, it can even get more uh, fluid kind of very thin application of the darker areas of your of your object go right out to the to the outline and put those in as you see them and one of the things that I'll show you in a moment is that uh, like any kind of art that uses color uh, even with black and white, you are, you are conscious of and will be using the fact of the, the dynamic whereby color becomes color by what's around it. I mean, right now, that seems to be fairly dark because it's, it's on a white canvas. It's on a, um, a, a field of snow and brilliant white and therefore, you know, doesn't seem terribly dark. And I think uh, as I'm looking at this, I will make it a little bit darker towards the left edge. But nonetheless, uh, to make these things still, the objects, the white objects, still retain their whiteness, um, you, are, you are realizing that what you put around it, what you put next to the colors, uh, will really allow you to, to see the colors as they are. I'm gonna go for one more slightly darker value in, uh, in this set against the edge here. And I'm gonna to try to keep that as wet as I've talked about. Uh, it's too dark. Try to keep your piles of paint relatively 
pure. And again, um, as, I, as I no doubt said in the initial painting, you're plowing and scraping. You are, you're not doing the, uh, the point of the palette knife mixing. You're trying to uh, fairly quickly mix an even amount. In this case, with this particular kind of painting, there are others to be gone through, but with this particular kind of painting, you're, you're dealing with uh, uh, a value that's fairly straightforward and, and not solid in the sense of thick paint, but, but evenly the same value for you to, to put it on. Again, my number four brush. And I think we're going to go, that's not too much of a difference, but still, it is good. Even more watery in my next application. Maybe a bit darker, too. At some point, you can, you know, you're using mostly your palette knife, but I see no reason why you can't uh, use your brush for freer, especially with this washy business, freer kind of edges of darker paint. Right, that's good. Again, we're even using just a wet brush to push things out, almost, almost like a watercolor in some of these areas. And again, uh, the other indispensable tool you have is that spray bottle because it not only uh, keeps the paint from drying out, but it gives you a more workable and, uh, and fluid application of paint. So I'm being relatively, relatively washy here. I could even get more washy. Let's see, did I see this here? We're just giving ourselves a note, a kind of uh, basic, simple notation of where the darks are. This is going to be covered up with many, many layers of paint after this. And that, that issue of relativity of color and how color affects color is, uh, is one that could be demonstrated very quickly uh, by your, at some point, fairly, fairly early on in your painting, I would ask you to, to do a darker, at least the, um, along some of the edges of your objects, do a darker value that would stand for the space. It could be something very close to black, Certainly a very darker value. And there's also the, the issue of, yes, putting in a, a, a flat black space or dark, dark space will be fine. Uh, but also, as we'll get to, to the end of this, this uh, still life, you'll see how if you manipulate the, uh, the space in the back so that it's, it's a little bit lighter or has some agitation of brush stroke in it, you end up with, uh, much more of a spatial, uh, a spatial aspect than a flat black, a flat black wall in back of the objects. The underpainting can be relatively messy. Here. But you see what happens when you put a darker value up against the object itself. It, it, I can readjust that edge. It becomes much more light. If you were to take a, a middle gray square and put it on a, a white wall, that in turn would be a fairly dark value. If you put it on a blackboard, it would be a very light value. 
So although I, I emphasize the fact that you're using the palette knife to mix basic piles of this stuff, once you've got the basic piles, um, you are welcome to, and really should, in these initial underpainting efforts, keep the brush wet, and you are welcome to, to put this kind of uh, quasi watercolor um, set of values in, because you really want to do something that's extremely thin. Now here's the cast shadow. Here's the here's the shadow that is uh, that is the result of the light uh, being blocked by the object itself. So what's obvious as you as you move away from the object is that um, the shadow gets lighter because more of the ambient light, more of the light from the rest of the room is um, is invading that cast shadow. So it's more, I'm just gonna give us a little bit of a notation with this watery stuff that this becomes lighter as we go away. there and darker as we move into close to the object itself although I you know for the most part wanting you to to be fairly simplified with the number four brush obviously there's no reason why you can't use the smaller brush uh, and the appropriate brushes in your pack of brushes to do uh, more manageable edges against the contours of the of the object. So I'm gonna make still watery, but nonetheless a little more precise uh, contours with this small, soft brush that is in your kit. So let me get a more basic and useful uh, rendering of the darkness up against the object and the lightness that happens. This is really free and and watery with your with your brush and values. And the nice thing about the taped edge, uh, obviously, is that you don't have to worry about putting on the brakes and stopping uh, as you get out towards the the edge. And the tape should be able to take a watery applications of paint as well as <clears throat> the thicker ones that will happen later. So big, simple, bold renderings. With any kind of painting, especially realistic painting, you know, it, it's usually the case, should be the case at first when you're learning, that, uh, that if you do the big, simple things first, the, the the, uh, the big value changes that happen, uh, the, the nuances that we all want to do. We want to get things real. We want to get things looking like they look. But if you put those, those in the context of the larger changes, the larger blocks of lights and darks in this case, you end up with something that, that is much more... Um, accurately structured compared to what you're doing, you're seeing. The other thing at this point that I, I want to point out, I mean, most of those of you who've had this kind of experience before, you know, I, I, am, I, I don't apologize to you, but, but uh, I know that m many of you know this, but where the tabletop exists, where that area exists, you don't want to simply leave it the white um, value of the canvas. They are, those surfaces are indeed subtly different and, uh, and off-white, 
and sometimes even blended into other sorts of values. So I'm gonna guess, this might be a little dark, but I'm gonna guess that something like this, as I get the drip here, can be a value for the tabletop. And I could even see um, nuances whereby it gets lighter as you're moving towards that right-hand area of the tabletop uh, that is closer to the light itself. And you want to do away with, as I'm trying to here, any kind of, of suggestion that there's an outline to the shadow. Uh, I'll work both inside and outside to eliminate that but you don't want the shadow itself to have a kind of, um, of outline to it, like a stained glass frame. You want, it, you want it to have a solid or at least nuanced and graded value that then stops and starts along that border. So long story short, the, the, the reason for all this is simply to, to uh, emphasize that you're painting this as well and that this tabletop itself is likely to have ever so slightly different values to it. As I had mentioned, um, the, the background space becomes a little bit more atmospheric and spatial if indeed you have um, some degree of color change, some degree of modeling or brush stroke or softness. You don't have to do it. You could get away with just a very dark gray or even a black. Uh, in, in that area, but what I'm gonna to try to do here, and especially with our, <clears throat> with our spray, very slightly mist, so that these things go on with a much more smooth brush stroke. I'm gonna start out fairly thin and move from a darker value. I'm using the bigger brush from a darker value, which I'll put out even more so, to a lighter value as I'm moving down the, uh, the canvas. I'll do it on this side in a kind of blended way so you see what's going on. I might use a little bit more black, i.e. Payne's gray. And relatively quickly, I mean, have your edges done somewhat, okay, uh, as you're doing this, had the edges around the tabletop uh, and or the, the bottle done so that you don't have to do too much fussing as you get close to it. But basically, with washy and fairly light value um, to dark value puddles, I'm doing, that's a little bit too light, attempting to do Feathery strokes, eventually with the, sl the smaller brush. I mean, in a way, you're thinking about the way the sky gets lighter toward the horizon line, and although you're not doing an outdoor landscape, you are sort of referencing that kind of psychology, that stuff up above is a bit darker, and stuff down below is less so. 
So as I mentioned earlier, you know, as you move out to the highlights, as you move out to those areas that are lighter, you get thicker and you get whiter. And I think in these kinds of nuances, these kinds of, um, of blendings, you're keeping things uh, in a kind of sweet spot of being wet enough to blend a little bit, but also uh, with layers thick enough to become almost textural. I don't, it's, it depends on your personal style, but I, I happen to like the idea that um, the paint stroke, the direction of the paint stroke, the shape of the paint stroke can actually sculpt and make things seem dimensional. So the very direction that you use, the very uh, mark that you make becomes not only a blending to make it rounder or to have it show form in space, but also becomes almost a pinched, scraped, uh, sculptural mark on a volume. So I've nearly completed this, and I, I didn't take you through uh, the many uh, uh, steps of, of mixing and blending and, and laying in colors, but let me just repeat and sort of review what I've done here uh, to give you an idea of how to, how to finish this off. Uh, you needn't do nth degree uh, photorealist blending. In fact, as you see in some of the examples uh, that are included in your, in your, in your email, the, uh, the, almost the, the, the uh, structure of the brush stroke, the simplification of zones, of values, is an important thing to do and doesn't necessarily have to be done you know, to, to a kind of airbrushed perfection, that there's something about the very um, texture of brush stroke and identity of brush stroke that makes for um, that makes for a, an expressive an expressive gesture across the, uh, the surface of the painting. In other words, the, the one with the most details doesn't necessarily win, although if you're proficient at that, if you've had experience in that, if you feel like you can handle uh, and, uh, and go for your aesthetic, your, your sense of beauty in painting is a perfect blending, then keep it wet, uh, spray it with the, mist, mist it with the water very lightly, mist your, keep your uh, palette misted very lightly, and, uh, and mix to the nth degree relatively fastly because the, the, uh, the detriment, the, the drawback of the acrylic paint uh, is indeed that it sets up, you know, much more swiftly in just a few minutes, uh, much more swiftly than, than oils. So um, I'm, I'm putting in some of these zones here. I mean, in this one, it's about three or four zones that are some, sometimes very, very uh, bordered and obvious, other times a little bit more blended. Uh, and whatever values you put into the to the object itself, I'm gonna put in a little bit more stark white here, where it's really been reflected and uh, illuminated by that light. The reason I have the, the close up and low light is for you to have pretty obvious you know, pretty strong uh, areas of value change so that uh, they're essentially not easier, but they're, but they're more obvious in their, in their positioning and their shapes. And of course, as we've done uh, previously, you see uh, that the background itself, that space, which you can either have at a table's edge or invent. You're welcome to just uh, make up this kind of line with your object or objects on the table. And again, give yourself the, uh, the, the, the surface of the table 
to a, to a reasonable expanse so you can place the objects on the table. But the space in back becomes not just an emptiness, not just a, a, um, a negative and uh, hamburger helper uh, um, area, but, but an active painted space that if you get into the action of the brush strokes here and there, and especially, as I've said before, if you, if you grade them down to a, to a lightness, a very subtle lightness at the edge of the tabletop, it becomes more of a space rather than some sort of dark wall that is in back of the whole still life. So um, to wrap this up, you are doing white objects. I've had this, I've had this uh, strange pomegranate bottle painted white for years as a, as a, as a pretty uh, standard object to demonstrate. And uh, you're, again, including not only the object itself, but the cast shadow. And just like the space, the cast shadow, as I've said before, becomes an element in the composition that can be, that can be uh, just as dramatic as anything else. So um, I'd also like to show you, and let's see if this works, since I've been so confident in, it, uh, in, its, in its description. What I've found uh, from the past uh, paintings like this is if you pull the tape uh, up and away, not just quickly and ripping down, but sort of slowly pull it up and away from the, the painting itself, you should have a fairly straight line that really sets off the painting that you've done with a kind of matte or uh, framing visual that allows for um, a nice presentation. Because of that gel medium, which had been put on there and dried before we began the painting, we've got, yes, success in having a fairly defined edge uh, for the entire painting. So for presentation and exhibition, you've got something uh, extremely presentable. So it comes down to the format, the number of objects you're going to do, and uh, the way you're going to do them terms of your assignment. Um, you've got to obviously do at least one. I prefer two. If you have experienced this kind of stuff before, then you're welcome to do a comp composition that is more complex. And what I'm going to do through these, uh, these several samples here as we, as we take a look at them is talk to you about perhaps different attitudes and different styles. This one here is fairly straightforward and it's, it's blended and modeled. That is uh, you know, it gradually goes from lights to darks uh, in a fairly um, uh, logical and, and, and even and soft way. Uh, you can see later ones that are going to be more harsh. But uh, this one here, the, the brush strokes are muted. They're not terribly um, obvious, but they're there. And one thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is even with a single object, uh, and obviously with the darker space in back, you've got uh, compositional elements, things that you're going to be designing uh, with beyond just the object. In other words, don't just think the object is done and it's done, but the very cast shadows in here, the degree to which the table uh, rises uh, in the composition. Uh, these are, these are, there are no rules for this, but be aware of those things and consider them to be as much a part of this, the still life as the objects themselves. So in this one, you see, obviously, a student who's had a lot of experience in this kind of painting. And what's beautiful about this, and what you might pick up, no matter what level you feel that you're at, is the idea that um, the brush strokes themselves don't have to be blended to the nth degree. In other words, the very direction, the very uh, texture, the very visibility of the action of painting can help to describe, it's almost like you're taking a, uh, a piece of clay or plasticine and pressing and pulling uh, that 
that kind of uh, that kind of image into something that's more three dimensional. So uh, don't be frightened by this sort of uh, uh, expressive excellence here, but do consider experiment with the idea that a visible brush stroke in a direction that begins to describe the object itself uh, is a is a is a plus in terms of of rendering it into a, a beautiful translation rather than just a, a photographic uh, reproduction. Now, in intro assignments, uh, there's always a temptation to uh, to overdirect, and I've begun to to tell you all that uh, a, a darker background um, is almost mandatory, and it does give you uh, a kind of simultaneous contrast with the lighter values in front to make things look more light and perhaps even have more uh, contrast on them. But this one here breaks the rules in a you know in a interesting way, in a way that uh, you're welcome to follow, especially if, as you see in the still life here, most of your shadows, most of your uh, darker values of the objects are turned substantially toward the viewer, toward the picture plane. So, uh, so you still have a kind of, um, of uh, strong contrast between the background and the, uh, the darkness of the objects in the foreground. Uh, I'd also say that uh, this is a very good background in terms of using brush strokes to make it more uh, atmospheric. There's almost a little bit of an aura around uh, the objects themselves, you know, setting them off. You don't want to push that too much, but nonetheless, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a light source from the, from the right that's hitting the edges of those things. And uh, it seems as though the, the light in the background is almost... Um, Expressing the in fact is expressing the idea that that light isn't is is radiating from that that direction and notice how the, the strong cast shadows in the lower left you know are really really strong forms in the entire composition. This particular painting uh, doesn't break the rules, but nonetheless uh, is somewhat different than the others, in that uh, you've almost got a theatrical. A light source that is substantially behind the objects, so that the the bubble bottle there, our friend the bubble bottle, uh, is almost in complete silhouette except for that uh, sliver of highlight that's up on the the upper uh, right and uh, midway down. So there's something dramatic, even though they're they're pretty straightforward, uh, simple sculptural objects that are bathed in light. They can be almost a kind of theater especially with the upright bottles and, and shapes, almost a theater of uh, personages or characters or, or figures that are in a kind of landscape, uh, in a kind of dramatically theatrical, backlighted situation. This one here uh, is a sort of radically simplified one. You may think it's uh, a bit uh, too simple, but I, I, I rather like the idea that that uh, the student has translated it, uh, interpreted it, almost as a kind of uh, a value chart uh, design exercise, and it has a kind of you know basic, brutal simplicity that doesn't take away from from quality. In other words, it's it's not a situation that the that those with the most toys, the most details, the most uh, photographically elegant uh, piece win. But, uh, but there's a, an element, as I've said before, of translation, taking the, the objects that are in front of you and, and interpreting them in some way that has a kind of boldness or subtlety or a kind of a softness or hardness that, uh, that is more expressive than simply a, a, a rendering. So consider, not just as a fallback, because I don't think it, it, I think it's more, simple, more sophisticated than you, you might imagine, but uh, consider the idea that you might zone lights and darks in ways that almost make it a kind of design exercise in, uh, in value separation. I just talked about the idea that uh, things might be translated into a value chart or a value uh, separation. Well, here, here's a student who, who did just that off to one side of the, of the still life. She's got a, uh, a bunch of 11 squares there in a vertical line that go from uh, black to white. And uh, that's a that's an exercise that's uh, that's fairly difficult to handle. Uh, if uh, if you choose an odd number like eleven, it becomes a little bit uh, more more uh, doable. 
because you've got this middle gray that, that moves towards, uh, towards either end of the dark or the light. Uh, and I think in this photograph, at least, it looks like the, the value chart is pretty good, but it, it, it tends to be stronger, as always, with our mixing of black up to the black uh, top. So we talked about uh, subject matter being white objects. I mentioned in the, the text that you could crumple pieces of paper or fold pieces of paper. Well, here's a student who's, as I remember, whose uh, heritage, you know, had to do with paper, paper sculpture, and she just uh, went to town on on the complexity of a folded sculpture, uh, folded paper sculpture, that that was a perfect uh, subject for this kind of exercise. You needn't do uh, many multiple objects if you've got something this complex. And note also how she's interpreted the surface, the table. On which this thing is lying. It could be substantially one sort of value, but she's almost, almost given it a kind of spotlight. I suspect that the, the object itself might have been in a kind of uh, uh, theatrical light, a spotlight that radiates from the upper left 